BBC Coventry and Warwickshire. 20 past 8, so we were just talking about the anniversary of the cathedral today, and that's uh, 50 years ago that that was consecrated today. There's another poignant anniversary, uh, not so happy unfortunately for the people of Coventry and Warwickshire today. 30 years ago was the day that we lost HMS Coventry, which was sunk by Argentine jets in the, uh, in the Falklands War. 19 men lost their lives as a result, 30 uh, were injured. Let's talk to the man in charge on that day. Uh, Captain of the ship, David Hart Dyke, joins us on the show. David, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Good morning. I, I read... Uh, an account, I think it was an account by you actually, of, of, of that day, a couple of days ago. And one of the things that really strikes you is, is how quickly, uh, the sort of events sort of transpired. As a result, are your recollection of that day quite, quite clear? Because it, it, it was a, a very fast process, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But, um, you know, for several days we'd been in that, uh, difficult spot, ready to protect the more important ships in the sound who were, um, looking after the amphibious ships and launching our troops, who in the end were going to win the war. So we were living dangerously to try and attract the enemy to us and to um, shoot them down with either our missiles or guiding the sea harriers. So we were all uh, geared up to extreme danger, if you like. And yes, you don't believe it's going to happen to you. And it happens extremely quickly, as you say. But you're so geared up for war, you can actually take any sort of punishment. And it was remarkably um, orderly and calm when disaster struck. And people just very sens sensibly got on and made preparations to abandon ship. But within about 20 minutes, um, the ship was upside down with a keel in the air. Um, but tragically, 19 men, as you said, lost their lives, mostly from the blast of the bombs. We the rest um, got out into life rafts and to safety. I, I know you, 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 you train, I mean, I mean all, all the men under your command train long and hard, you know, to, to, for, for these kind of eventualities, but I mean, did you have any idea that Coventry could be lost in that kind of period of time? 20 minutes is, is amazingly quick, isn't it? Yes, it is, but, um, you know, if you look back in history, it's happened before with warships, uh, even shorter times than that, ships, uh, huge ships have gone down. And that's the nature of warfare, so I think we weren't actually surprised looking back. Um, anyway, at the time, as I said, you know, we can cope even with that. Uh, but it's only when you've um, recovered and looking back, you realise, you know, what a horrendous uh, situation it was, and it takes a bit of time to recover from it. But at the time, you cope with it quite remarkably, admirably. When, when did you realise that, because as you say, you were, you were in, uh, operating in a heightened state of awareness and a heightened state of readiness because you were you were doing dangerous work anyway but when did it occur to you that this is a very very serious situation was it when the planes came through and you realized that that you were unable to fight back against them yes i mean the, for several days you know up to the end as it were um we were fighting these aircraft who have flown quite brilliantly at very at wave top height um and of course our missile system wasn't designed to take on targets flying that low and we didn't have any close range weapons uh, of any worth to speak about so it was an extremely dangerous game we were playing but necessarily we had to take the risks uh, rather than uh, more important ships with all the troops on board in Falkland Sound and we had to remain in that position to remain in communication with them to tell them about the air threat and to support them did you, did you have any air cover at the time or not? I mean, were you just, was it literally you, you on the ocean and, and, and them flying just above it? I mean, was it, was it that kind of fight? Was there any, was there any air cover at all? Uh, no, the sea, we had 20 sea harriers and, um, uh, they were being generated from the carriers, which is about 100 miles, you know, to the east of us. Yes, so they were on task for quite a short time. So yes, we did have air cover, but it's very limited and for a short period of time. So you had to make the best use of them before they had to turn home. But they were remarkably effective and shot down a huge number of airplanes. So that was my, in a sense, the major weapon system, the Harriers. If they were there and if the weather was, enable them to get there. Otherwise, you had your missiles. I was also um, supported by a, a frigate with a close range missile system, mm. which was also there to help protect me and take on the airplanes. Given that you only lost 
19 men. It's almost a miracle that you only lost 19 men because when you think the hundreds of men on board and anybody who's been involved in any kind of evacuation, whether it be from a, uh, a commercial aircraft or from a building or from whatever, you'll know that there is that very frightening period where you think, I'm not sure how much of this is training and how much of this is adrenaline. I mean, how did that, getting the men off the ship, I mean, how did that, did that work well or was it organised close? I mean, how did that happen? Well, it, it, it was remarkable and still remained absolutely remarkable to me because the, the command, the senior people in the ship, that's me in the operations room, were really effectively taken out. We were in no position to make any decisions. And the other senior people were down at the after end of the ship, the damage control people. A lot of them were taken out. So it was a lot of the young men mm. on their own initiative took charge and uh, organised the abandoned ship. Um, so it's just training uh, and a lot of other intangibles like high morale, uh, discipline, um, looking after your your colleagues, etc. They just sort of um, clutch in instinctively. When you've been living dangerously, you know, that's what comes to the fore. And remarkably brave things are done, uh, which are not normally done at any other time in life. But when you're, when it's survival, you see remarkably remarkable things being done. That's where that's where heroes usually emerge, isn't it? Uh, there's a wonderfully in the whole story. There's this wonderfully British moment where well, there's a couple actually. But, but is it is it true, or is this an urban myth now? Is it true that the uh, the crew once in the lifeboats were always were singing, always look on the bright side of life? Yes, that's true. Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, the, the humour is, is amazing, and that sort of was sparkling all the way along in those last few days. Uh, so people were actually extremely cheerful, but we all knew, but we didn't say it, that, you know, we were being risked and we were going to sustain some damage. Because after all, you know, two other ships had been sunk the day or two before. So I used to sit in my cabin wondering, you know, what damage we sustained and how many casualties we would um, sustain. But I never actually thought we'd be sunk in such a short time. Mm. Uh, and you gave an impromptu performance of Rat Trap as well, did you, by the Boomtown Rats? Well, I didn't, personally. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I'd actually been talking to you, I thought, I'm not sure you'd know all the words. Maybe you had them on a sheet of paper, I don't know. I've got to ask you this as well, because I read this, there was this huge article and the story was absolutely gripping. I know you've, you've, you've actually written a book about, uh, about your, uh, your time and, and Coventry is, is one of the things that's, that's, that's part of it as well, of course, isn't yeah. it? But there's a wonderful account by you and the, and the headline, was was all about um was it father of miranda hart and all this kind of stuff and i thought no whilst i i have no doubt that you're proud of your your eldest daughter miranda and her tv success does it kind of frustrate you a bit you know there you are talking about a very serious time in your life something that was very emotional something where 19 men lost their lives and and you know the press the the, the written press can distill that down into you know this kind of like um uh, pop culture thing oh he, he's the dad of miranda hart does that frustrate you at all no it doesn't um and i haven't seen the article you're talking about but it is true um that when i go and see my colleagues perhaps there's a reunion uh, which i have been recently uh I'm quite keen to talk about perhaps the old times or um, even about the Falklands, <laughs> which yeah. the event is all about. But then they come up to me and say, oh, I want to talk about Miranda. Um, no, I don't mind at all. But, I mean, there's obviously serious time when we talk about reminiscence about our days in 1982. But, yes, Miranda does feature, but I think that's inevitable, and that's the, the times we live in. Celebrities do sort of hit the headlines. Absolutely. Listen, it's lovely to talk to you. Fascinating story as well. Uh, four Weeks in May. Is that out yet? Is that out now, your book? Uh, four Weeks in May, my book. Yes, no, it came out uh, three or four years ago and, um, you know, sold extremely well. And it, it isn't just an ordinary story. I mean, it's a story about what it's like going to war, the psychology of warfare and, and recovering after tragedy. So it's a book for all people, male or female. It's not a technical blow-by-blow blow history of naval warfare. David, fantastic to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, incredible experiences with us this morning. We wish you well. David Hart Dyke.